Welcome back to One Piece Explained. We got a ton of news this past week for the second season of the live action One Piece series, and with Geek Week finally coming to an end, I figured it would be useful to go through all of the casting news, sneak peeks, and details you may have missed throughout all of the festivities. Not only that, but I'll also be breaking down a table read teaser that was shared and then immediately taken down. We're not really sure just why they did this, but what we do know is that there are several characters and their associated actors featured in that video that have not yet been formally announced. If you end up enjoying this video, or have been a fan of any of the other live action coverage that I've been doing for the past year or so, I'd appreciate it if you liked the video and subscribed to the channel. It helps me out and lets you get all of my breakdowns as soon as they come out. That said, let's get into it. Things kicked off on Wednesday with a set tour video hosted by Jeff Ward, who plays Bucky the Clown. In it, we got a ton of really cool teases, including set locations, character costumes, props, and so much more. I did a full frame-by-frame -frame breakdown of that video, hunting down all the little details we could find, so if you're interested in that, there'll be a link on screen and in the description to that video. But not too long after the set tour video came out, disaster struck as the official Netflix website jumped the gun and updated the cast listing to include Joe Manganiello and Lyra Abova as Mr. Zero and Mr all Sunday. Not only that, but the independent Netflix news site What's on Netflix tweeted the premature announcement as well, with major publications and news platforms following suit. This news of course was no surprise to many fans who have been following the live action with a microscope, as the good people of the One Piece live action discord had suspected these two actors for these two roles for months now. But this was all news to the general public, and unfortunately did take away from the big reveal that was to come during the Geek Week live event on the following day. Though, everyone seemed to roll with the punches and even poked some fun at the leak. Anybody heard any good rumors lately? What was the hardest part about keeping your casting a secret? <laughs> you, you want to tell them? We did our job. <laughs> we, we did. We did no mistakes whatsoever. But I do have to say, One Piece fans are unbelievable. They knew almost right away. I could have just loved One Piece. I could have just been a big fan. I could have been a friend of Matt's, but you all figured it out. The website was updated soon after to remove the two names, and the mistake was acknowledged by an official channel. Later that evening, a few photos were shared from the set tour video, one of which showed Jeff visiting Jaco Snyman, the head of the prosthetics department. In the back, you can spot some of the prosthetics used for Arlong and Kurobi in Season 1, as well as Garp's transponder snail over here, but more interestingly, there is a marine transponder snail underneath that doesn't look to be doing so well. It's not really clear what's going on with it here, or who would be on the other end. Transponder snails tend to mimic their user's expression, so perhaps it's imitating someone dying on the other side. We'll just have to see. Now let's talk about the event itself. On Thursday, September 19th, the live stream kicked off with a Squid Game themed intro as Joe, who was also the host of the event, appeared on stage in a tracksuit worn by the participants of the Squid Game. In the show, the number on the suit corresponds to when they were recruited to the game, but of course Joe's suit number was 000, nodding to the eventual reveal of him being cast as Mr. Zero. Not only that, but his fingers were adorned with multiple rings, just like his character in the source material. Jeff Ward also appeared in the show later on, giving a fandom cosplay award for best transformation. Joe later then returned to the stage for news about the Sandman series, which of course is very fitting given Mr. Zero's abilities, and as part of the live show, actors were to play various games on stage in order to reveal information about their given series, and here, Joe pulled out an hour class to time the event, harkening back to his use of a similar device during the Alabasta arc. Now toward the end of the show, Matt Owens joined in and came on stage to announce Joe Manganiello as Mr. Zero, who appeared with a desert lily in his front pocket. This was of course a nod to his first appearance in the source material where we got a tease of his abilities with him dehydrating the flower. Now, Crocodile does not have much of a presence in the Alabasta Saga until the Alabasta arc. He briefly appears during Little Garden, during his transponder snail exchange with Sanji, but then isn't really seen again until the very last chapter of the Drum Island arc as the crew sails away, and Crocodile is informed of some troublesome pirates in town, though there his appearance is still obscured. It's not until the following chapter when he arrives in Nanohana that we get his appearance in full, and I can totally see the sequence being adapted to show him off at the end of the season, setting up the major antagonist of the next installment of the series. Now, outside of the Alabasta Saga, Crocodile was also present at Roger's execution, but for some reason this was not adapted during the scene at the start of the live action series. I know a lot of people think this actress here was supposed to be Crocodile due to the popular fan theory that Crocodile was once a woman, and while I think the theory itself is certainly possible, no evidence has been found suggesting that this character here was intended to be Crocodile in this scene. 
at least not from anyone involved with the production, of course. It's more likely that the intent behind their inclusion was to draw the viewer's eye toward the young Shanks in the background with a straw hat. Now, with that said, we do know Michael Dorman has returned to reprise his role as Gold Roger in Season 2, and with the Loketown set being decorated to celebrate the anniversary of Gold Roger's execution, I'd imagine we get the flashback from Season 1 extended in some form, giving us the perfect opportunity to fit in Crocodile. I also would not be surprised if they reworked some things to extend his presence across more of the season. We've speculated for a while now that Baroque Works may be involved with the Drum Island arc in the live action, given that it is the climax for season 2, and with that peculiar Baroque Works Jolly Roger that we spotted in the set tour video that somewhat resembles Wapple's features, this seems like it's not out of the realm of possibility just yet. Of note, it's unlikely that he would be involved with anything directly in the first two episodes of the season, since we did learn during this event that Joe has not yet made it out to set just yet, but anything afterwards feels like fair game. I'll also talk more about a certain possibility involving Crocodile toward the end of this section. We also got the formal announcement of Lyra Abova as Miss All Sunday. Now, Miss All Sunday is in a similar spot to Mr. Zero, where she does not have a major presence until the Alabasta arc proper, though she is fully introduced at the tail end of the Whiskey Peak arc. After that, she's not seen again until the Little Garden arc, where she was alongside Crocodile during his exchange with Sanji, and is also with him at the end of the Drum Island arc, where she informs him about the pirates attacking Nanohana. There isn't too much from her history that could be adapted based on what we know the season will cover so far, though I could see them expounding upon this exchange between her and Vivi, where we learn that Miss All Sunday allowed her to learn of Mr. Zero's identity. That said, I do expect there to be more of her in this season, perhaps even being an overarching villain since Wapple was mostly confined to his own arc up until this point. Matt Owens did mention that she had already been in hair and makeup, suggesting her involvement in filming so far, which would make sense given that Logetown is in episode 1, leaving Reverse Mountain and maybe even some of Whiskey Peak for episode 2. From there, Matt goes on to ask the two some questions when Jeff Ward crashes the party with his character's theme playing in the back, and jokingly picks a fight with Joe, as the two start comparing bounty sizes. And if you're curious, Buggy's bounty is less than a fifth of Crocodile's at the time, though since Crocodile is one of the seven warlords of the sea, his bounty was frozen, much like we saw with Mihawks in Season 1, and realistically, it probably would have been higher at that point. Now for the last part of this section, I'll be breaking down something mentioned that has some pretty big spoilers for much later in the series, so if you'd like to remain unspoiled, feel free to skip ahead to the next section, where we'll be taking a deep dive into all of the hidden details in that table read video that was shared at this event. All right, now Matt settles the two down by saying, well, let's just roll the footage. Guys, Joe, Jeff, listen, on what? one of these, we are, we are a family. We are like a guild. Let's not get cross with one another. Oh, cross. It's not, let's... I kind of like the sound of that. Yeah? yeah. This is, of course, a clear reference to Cross Guild, the eventual team up between Buggy, Crocodile, and Mihawk. While Buggy and Crocodile did initially join forces during Impel Down, Cross Guild is a relatively more recent development in the story, and as such, wouldn't make much sense at all given the state the live action is in. That said, we do have some reason to speculate that Mihawk would be involved in Season 2, based on the set tour video showcasing a wall of wigs, where we saw some facial hair that very closely resembled his. Now, in the source material, his character does not appear at all during the Alabasta saga, with his last appearance being adapted during the end of Season 1, meaning whatever Mihawk is up to in this season will be an original inclusion to the story. I don't think they would formally include Cross Guild so early, but I would not be surprised at all if any of these characters run into one another. After all, Buggy does need something to do in the remainder of the season after Logetown, given that he does not appear again in the source material until Jaya. The One Piece portion of Geeked Week ended with another video showing a table read with the cast and crew. The video was also shared simultaneously across various official platforms and social media, but for some reason was taken down during the next day. However, you can still find the footage in the VOD of the Geeked Week livestream on the Netflix YouTube channel. It's not entirely clear what motivated them to take down the table read footage, especially since it included the tease of Chopper at the end, but I have to wonder if it was because someone may have accidentally revealed more of the casting than they intended. So let's go through some of that. At the head of the table are our five straw hats, but there is one name tag to Jacob's right. When you see him initially sitting down, you can see that it reads Chopper. But of course, there is no seat associated with that spot when we get this wider shot of the room, and there's no microphone either. This was likely just placed there as this room is the one that was used for the Chopper tease at the end. And for some greater context, not everyone seated here is an actor on the show. For example, we have the showrunner Matt Owens here, and beside him is executive producer Chris Symes. Also of note, this table read was likely done before the filming of the first block 
after the first pair of episodes, and as such, every character here would likely be in Logetown, Verse Mountain, and or Whiskey Peak. And for some more context, not every character in those arcs are necessarily in this room. Actors have varying schedules and commitments, so it's likely that some of them arrived after this thing was filmed. Now moving ahead, on the other side of Matt Owens and Chris Symes, who's out of frame in this shot, are two men who have not been able to identify, but down from them we have a whole bunch of characters. Zara Jaslin's Miss Valentine, Julia Rewald's Tashigi, and Daniel Lasker's Mr. Nine. In between Daniel and Julia is Daniel Barnett, who will be playing Sapi, the fishmonger from Logetown who sells Sanji the elephant true bluefin. We saw his costume on display in the set tour video. On the other side between Julia and Zara is Fadzai Samango, playing Officer Mashikaku. Now I was particularly excited about this casting, as Mashikaku is a relatively overlooked character in the series at large. While unnamed at the time, he's first introduced as the marine informing Smoker about the pirates in Logetown, and he's since been seen with Smoker and Toshigi throughout the series, so I'm glad they're giving the character the respect he deserves. Also, big shout out to the good people of the One Piece Live Action Discord for tracking down the names of these actors. To Daniel's left is actor Richard Gao, and it's not really clear what role he has in this season, Yorkie has been speculated, but nothing solid so far. On the other side of the table are a few familiar faces as well. Here we see Aiden Scott reprising his role of Helmeppo from season 1. A few spots down is Clive Russell, who plays Crocus, and beside him is Charith Rashandran, who, who plays our Vivi. On the other side of Clive looks to be Claire Glover, who would be returning for her role as Officer Sada. This was an original character for the live action. Now, it's unclear what the two characters on the other side of Charithra are, but the man immediately to her left has been identified as Marshall T. Batchaman. Again, shout out to the One Piece live action Discord for spotting that. Now, aside from the Straw Hats, people's seating doesn't necessarily feel like it lines up with who their characters are, as evidenced by a row including Mr. Nine, Sapi, Tashigi, Mashikaku, and Miss Valentine. But given his proximity to Vivi, I wonder if he'll be playing Igaram in this season. To the other side of Helmeppo is an actress who I am not entirely sure on, but between him and Sada are two seats with somewhat interesting characters. Immediately next to Sada looks to be Nahum Hughes, who is playing Bartolomeo. Now this casting was actually leaked a few weeks ago, as his CV had included his role as Bartolomeo on it, but I believe this has since then been removed after the news broke. Bartolomeo is a character that gets introduced much later on in the series, but we come to learn that he was actually present in Logetown when Luffy declares his dream to become Pirate King on the execution platform. And from various leaks of other actors' audition tapes for this role, we've come to learn that this character may be involved in some sort of a friendly competition to see who was a better thief, largely speculated to be against Nami. In the audition script, he ends up being tricked into stealing from a marine, which we believe may be what prompts Nami's line here. Happy hunting! That line may make you think of Little Garden with Zoro and Sanji's hunting competition, but recall that this table read would only be for Logetown, Reverse Mountain, and potentially Whiskey Peak. Now beside Bartolomeo is an actor who is a bit hard to make out here, but we get a slightly better look at him as he approaches his seat while talking to Claire Glover's Officer Sada. This may be Anthony Osayemi, who was supposed to play Commander Ripper in Season 1, but the role was unfortunately cut. Ripper is the head marine commander who takes charge of the 153rd branch after Luffy and Zoro defeat Max Hand Morgan. And that's about it for all the characters I was able to spot. Once again, I just want to shout out the One Piece Live Action Discord for being able to identify some of these actors. I'm not really good with actors and names, so if you think you spotted someone I didn't recognize, be sure to let us know in the comments. Now there are a few lines said by the Straw Hats such as Luffy exclaiming about the ride, or Usopp being nervous about the size of the mountain, and these would all seem to be from their ride up Reverse Mountain. Alright, now that said, let's talk about Chopper. While we didn't get the full reveal for Chopper's design, it does seem like he will be created from CGI. There could be a mix of practical puppetry involved as well, similar to how the transponder snails were physical objects that were made to blink in emote with CGI, but we'll just have to see. I do like the attention to detail we get here though, as you can spot the metal brace Chopper has on his left antler as a result of it being broken off during his flashback. Also of note, his antlers have a thin layer of fur over them, and this is a real world phenomenon called velvet antler, where a velvet like skin develops around the antlers of a young deer while the antler is not yet fully developed. This is also why Chopper's antlers are rounded at the ends, as he is still not a fully grown adult. I for one am not too picky when it comes to what Chopper will look like, but there is a growing concern that Chopper will be made to look much more closer to his appearance later on in the series, where Oda draws him with larger eyes and much more chibi features. Over time, Chopper has become a bit of a mascot for the series, being a cash cow for merchandise, and I can totally see Netflix wanting to go this route with his design in an effort to replicate the success of things like Baby Yoda. 
Yoda. My only concern is that the CGI is expensive, and having a fully CGI character be part of the crew will either mean more resources will be needed to make it work, or Chopper will be sidelined at times because it just costs money to have him on screen. In such a case, I wouldn't mind a cuter design be used if it means generating more revenue for merchandising. Now we do have some reason to believe Chopper's heavy point will be played by a real actor, as Gavin Gomez's involvement was leaked via CV as well, alongside Bartolomeo's presence a few weeks ago. Though, it's not totally clear if this is actually for motion capture, or if we'll actually be playing the character with prosthetics. We'll just have to see. As for when we'll get through a full reveal for his design, I would expect it to be one of the final things we see in the first teaser trailer. We are still a long way out from that though, so until then, just know that I'll be covering everything live action related on this channel. If you enjoyed this video or any of the other breakdowns I have for the series, be sure to like and subscribe so you can get more of them as soon as they come out. Thank you so much for watching, stay safe, and I hope to see you in the next one.